there is a nutrient driving sleep apnea that is recommended all the time because it's quote unquote healthy for everybody at all times. But the problem is when you combine this compound with unique problems with sleep apnea, it actually becomes toxic inside of the body. So that's why I wanna go over what this is here today. I'm Dylan Peckis, if we haven't met before, this is what I wish I knew when I had sleep apnea back in medical school, now I've reversed it. And everything here is for educational purposes only. Always talk to your doctor. So it all starts with a perfect storm of crud that is sleep apnea. And the first part of this is that you have a ton of inflammation and a lot of these free radicals that are being generated and created inside of your body because of these swings in oxygen. Now, because of that, you'll see all these different markers go up inside the body. And there's one compound in particular that is the smoking gun, if you will, of this particular toxicity driven by this nutrient. It's right here. It's malondialdehyde or MDA for short. And eventually I'll mispronounce it if I didn't already just now. And there's only one way to make this because this compound, MDA, is way higher in people with obstructive sleep apnea. And when we look to our chef of how to make this, we'll kind of start in reverse. So you have MDA down here, and it comes from all these different fatty acids. Now, if you look really closely, you will see these radicals, all right? Those are those free radicals that I mentioned before generated by the big swings in oxygen. And these free radicals will interact with this first starting ingredient over here, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids, or PUFA, as I will say. That's what it stands for. There's many different classes of these. So if you've heard of omega-3, that's a type of PUFA. If you've heard of arachidonic acid, that's a type of PUFA. So if you combine the PUFAs plus the free radicals, that will lead to MDA, which causes a ton of additional damage throughout the body. Very, very bad. And that's something that's shown in research time and time again, that when you have intermittent hypoxia plus the PUFAs, you will get a lot of bad things, even such as heart disease starting to take place. And we'll talk about PUFAs, but I also want to say it's not just PUFAs. There's another nutrient that compounds this whole thing, but we're just going to focus on PUFAs for the time being because we do not want to throw out the, the baby from the fish oil here. That'd be an interesting combination here because there's a lot of good benefits from PUFAs. They lower the risk of cancer. They lower the risk of dementia. They lower the risk. Of, like it, it's, it's just a good thing to have. But obviously, we need to make sure we're doing things correctly. So the research has shown that one of the most important PUFAs to reduce is linoleic acid. Obviously, you remember that from the chart directly. That's one of those omega-6s that was on the right side of that chart here. Because that's the one that's most responsible for all of the bad stuff in terms of the MDA formation. Now, linoleic acid, if you took some corn and you squeeze it really hard, uh, that'd be weird. You have a mess on your hands, but you would also have a little bit of linoleic acid. Think of it as vegetable oil, where a lot of people are talking about sea oils being bad, vegetable oils being bad. This is actually one of the primary compounds within it that makes it bad news bears. So some of the top foods in this, sapphire oil, sunflower oil, pine nuts, in case you were eating a large amount of pine nuts because you're really bougie or something, or I mean, no, pine nuts are expensive. I'm going to stick on that one. Soybean oil, sunflower oil. I think you get the point here. And the very important thing, is that it will be very easy to spot. And you may think, Dylan, when the heck am I eating sapphire oil? Like, what do you take me as? There will be obvious things to avoid, like avoiding certain nuts. But a lot of times, you do need to check the labels of your foods. Even like a healthy protein bar, it'll be loaded up with sapphire oil or corn oil. So a lot of these foods will be hidden because they're so commonly used. So not only will it be hidden in the labels of certain foods, but also a lot of people don't think about PUFA-fed foodstuffs. You also need to be aware of PUFA-fed foodstuffs or pufa for short. No one says that that way. I'm just making fun of the excessive use of acronyms in this episode. So this is where grass-fed and grass-finished beef, because now apparently they just try to ruin everything, uh, whether it's pork, chickens, etc., and one of the worst contenders is also chickens because chickens will be fed corn and then they'll take on a lot of that fat there. And in case you're wondering how popcorn chicken is made, this is true, by the way. This is undisputable. If you feed chicken popcorn, that's how you get popcorn chicken. Lame jokes aside, we do want to make sure that we increase the good fatty acids, but do so carefully. Because the thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the omega-6s, if we look over here, they are more likely to become inflammatory. 
they're not the only ones that can become inflammatory. They're just more likely. Our omega-3s, even though we're told they're awesome all the time, they can actually betray us. Betrayal comes when you least expect it from who you least expect it from here. So we want to talk about how to optimize those good fatty acids and talk about that, that mystery nutrient, which will no longer be a mystery shortly. So like I said, finding the right balance of omega-3. And also, I am not sure who sets up these photo shoots, but like there's always at least half of these things that are just like dead wrong as rich sources of omega-3. Is this lentils over here? In what universe do lentils have high omega-3? Nobody fact checked me on that, by the way. But nonetheless, a lot of times we will reflex to fish oil because it may not be convenient, you know, to whip out a can of salmon at lunch. Maybe it is if you want people to avoid you. I'd highly recommend it for that. But what they found in New Zealand, because this is where they ask these very important questions, are the omega-3s in fish oil, are they heavily oxidized? And as research has found, yes, 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 they are by quite a bit. So they found that different levels of oxidative things, that's what PV, AV, Totoxes, you know, more acronyms in this episode are great. They were all pretty high. And a lot of the time, the amount of the fish oils, you read this here, look at my cursor, only three of the 32 fish oil supplements contain the quantities of omega-3 that were stated on the bottle. So fish oil, um, we'll talk about how to fix that if you want to know it. And then the other big problem is when you go to fish, well, like you, you, I mean, I guess you can go fishing, but I mean like ingesting fish, is how you cook it. So this is a study where a bunch of scientists decided to cook a bunch of fish and see what happened. So if we zoom on just one aspect of this, they're looking at 4-HHE, you know, that it's it's similar to MDA in a way. It's a product of lipid oxidation, like PUFA oxidation. So they looked at how do the levels of this bad compound increase when we cook salmon. So the baseline would be raw, right? No debating that. And then if you boil it, it goes up a little bit. Next, when you fry it, that goes way up. This is fried in a pan at medium high heat. If you bake it, it goes up. Not as much here. So Gordon Ramsay, that's why he loves raw fish there. But we'll talk about how you don't need to eat sushi because you may be confused. Oh man, I thought I was doing myself good. We'll, we'll, we'll fix it here. So fish oil, biggest thing is doing DIY for sure. You want to, you know, squeeze your fish yourself, get the, the fish oil will come right out of the mouth there. That's not a real thing. You want to look for specific metrics on a product. So for instance... I mean, in order of like best to have to, uh, you know, still good, but not as like great. They're able to provide some certificates of analysis showing those different things I alluded to earlier, the peroxide value, uh, all these different oxidative stress markers. Very few of them have this. This is just like, this would be A plus if you could find this and uh, have it be in the right place. Another one third party validation things like that's like the stamps on the side you often see like IFOS there, uh, USP, those will have certain standards. You want to make sure the packaging is looking good. I mean, I guess looking dark, rather, it doesn't matter how attractive it is, as long as the glass is dark, like brown, green, uh, black, I guess, that will shield from a lot of things that will lead to oxidation. And then, and then you want to look for natural antioxidants that had been added, like rosemary extract, uh, even like vitamin E being in there. Uh, sometimes they add like the weird stuff in there, avoid the weird stuff. If you can't like pronounce it, well, okay, tosiferol is hard to pronounce. So you've learned the word tosiferol, but anything more difficult to pronounce than tosiferol, avoid if it's in fish oil here. So that, that's it with fish oil. I don't really love fish oil. If I was given a choice between the two, Fish is always going to be the best, but there's one problem. Well, I guess I just gave you the solution here. We'll just ignore that. So anticlimactic. But the problem is when you have fish and it's caught in Alaska, unless you live in Alaska, caught in Alaska, it's frozen, it's shipped to you. Cool. The PUFA content goes down and it shifts to the oxidized version of it. That's not great. And in fact, if you look at, or compare rather, the amount of good omega-3 available in like locally caught fish, 
that may not be like, oh man, you know, powerhouse omega-3 like salmon is. That's what Big Salmon wants you to think, by the way. And if I'm not here next week, you know who got me. So being able to have local fish that's relatively fresh, I would say is actually superior than getting frozen salmon shipped from Alaska to your front, side, back door, whatever. Now, in doing so, I would not recommend just getting, you know, goldfish out of your fish tank, but it really depends on where you live. And uh, I'll just keep this limited to the United States. I'm assuming other countries have fish. I have not verified that yet. But for instance, I'm down here in Florida, even though snapper and grouper don't have high levels of omega-3, if you had it on a chart of raw salmon versus raw grouper. But again, if we bring salmon like down by a third, it would be on par with fresh grouper. If you're in the middle of the country, walleye is apparently a thing. So just, you know, do your due diligence and make sure that no one's fishing near a lake, near a paper mill. That's going to be bad for your health, in case you didn't know. And speaking of paper mills and bad transitions, you may want to write this one down. This is the mystery of nutrient that's no longer a mystery that actually makes us all worse in terms of oxidizing more PUFAs to make things bad. So the nutrient is heme iron. So what makes heme different? It's in a heme group and it is more bioavailable and bioactive. If you take a bunch of lab rats and you force them to eat fish and, you know, high iron foods, um, it causes issues with lipid peroxidation. That's why avoiding foods that are super high in them, well, not, you don't need to avoid them across the board. Just don't eat them at the same time. That's because the oxidation will happen in the gut. And also if they're both high in the blood at the same time, that's where you'll get that cross reactivity there. So things like liver, spleen, clams, I guess. So sorry for your organ meat surf and surf, but also, I mean, just steak, right? That will also be high in this here. So you want to keep those away from your high omega-3 meals. And the same goes if you're supplementing with this, like you're using a ferrous sulfate, but again, Never ever make any changes based off what I say in the video. Always talk to your doctor. Speaking of things we don't want to forget, remember, we only really did half of this equation here, right? We covered the PUFA part of this problem, but even if we get our PUFAs dialed in, if we're still having the intermittent hypoxia from bad breathing, things are not going to be as fun. So that's why being able to take your breathing from this, you know, this fast or regular pace where things are kind of closing down in your throat from that fast inhale, suction things down. You want to get that to nice, slow, steady, so it keeps your airway open. You're addressing both parts of those equations to have good, healthy levels of inflammation, aka low levels of inflammation and a lot more good health. So that's why I made the instant apnea relief protocol that you can get for free. It's really awesome. It contains assessments so you can get personalized custom starting points for breathing, or different exercises of the airway and also some cellular health things. It's really awesome here. So you can go ahead and click this button in the middle. If it's there, it's a big red button. Don't click the thing above it. Click the big red button. Or if you're like 40% of people on TV, just whip out another device and go to apneareset.com forward slash show right there on the screen for you there. Or just click here in the middle. Either way, I'm Dylan Peckis and I'll see you on the next page.